नमस्ते शिवानंद सुपदा फाउंडेशन भीमनपट्ट इज़ डिवोटेड टू टेक फॉर्वर्ड सद्गु शिवानंद मूर्ति जी मिशन बै पब्लिशिंग हिस् स्पीचेस एंड रईटिंग्स एंड होलिंग सेमिनार्स इज सिंपोजिम्स एंड कॉन्फ्रेंस आन वेरिय थीम्स रिलेटिंग टू सनातन धर्म भारत कलचर एंड इट्स हिस्ट्री बिसाइड्स सोशियो कलचरल एंड स्परीचुअल टापिक्स इन पर्सियंस ऑफ दि अबोव आबजेक्टिस we organized an international symposium on reconstructing the cultural history of bharat at integral institute of advanced management visakhapatnam on february 18th and 19th inviting reputed scholars from bharat and abroad to enlighten us on various themes relating to the problems and perspectives in writing bharat cultural history on truthful and purposeful lines the erudite presentations of these scholars are presented in this channel kindly subscribe and encourage us in our endeavor to promote sanatan dharma dr arvind rao garu he is a friend philosopher of our organization elderly man and he has been with us since yesterday is just as a very sincere student has been listening to every speech and he has been with us and now we are going into the very crux of the problem that is we are speaking about sanatana dharma all the time sanatan sanatan what is sanatana sanatana sanatan means how it is sanatana how it is new today how is it is old yesterday but it's not old it has been eternal and this and that we had been discussing so uh, bharat culture when we take bharat culture is it just sociological cultures or economic cultures or the other cultures that we generally know from the past 200 years we have been making so many theories to define culture so but then what is bharat culture it's only physical culture or it has has it something to do with the mind the thinking and with the heart and with the soul and with the search of the soul and all that so our uh, problem today at this meeting is has it any philosophical foundation so we, we are speaking so much of culture bharat culture has it any philosophical foundations and uh, we want to hear this from uh, our philosophy expert Oh, he is, he is, uh, who has been trained from none other than Pullala Sri Ramachandrudar. He is his disciple. And we request him to come over here and speak on the philosophical foundations of Bharat culture. <laughs> Welcome, sir. first of all i offer my pranams to pooja guru ji uh, who my with whom i had a fairly long association though not uh, like you but in a slightly different way in the sense that though i was uh, asp under training long long ago here in uh, vizag that was in 1979 probably some of these people might not have been born at that time i was asp under training and uh, at that time somehow i am don't remember whether i met him or not but then i first met him in 1984 when i went as superintendent of police warangal so i was there at the time by that time i think he had just uh, resigned from the department in fact he is my from my own i can say we can we are from the same family they were from the same police department he had just retired not retired but he took uh, he just left it he just gave it up and then he, then there i met him there at the time he was conducting some uh, yagnas here and there and then he was giving some talks about all the already some spiritual talks he was giving so there i met him and there after not in a very regular way but occasionally i used to meet him i with uh, some other friends we used to go and then of course i didn't i never uh, asked any anything personal there was no personal questions <laughs> 
because no personal question from me. Uh, but then uh, we used to meet and then discuss uh, things like uh, same same subject now, Sanatana Dharma, uh, how to. Uh, say preserve this tradition of uh, scholarship at that time 84, eight, nine, some 94, 95 when I got interested in this subject. My greatest anxiety was how to preserve the Shastra tradition because I, I could find some of these old Shastra scholars, hardly about 10, 15 people. When I was doing my MA in Sanskrit and particularly thereafter I was also pursuing my studies for, uh, for my PhD, I could not find uh, teachers who, were, who could teach in Sanskrit. <laughs> So that was the problem and could not find people who could tell various other, there were only a few people who were called Chatushastra Pandita. So one, of the, one after the other, they were in their 70s and 80s and once they passed away, what is going to happen to this culture, or this uh, tradition of this Shastra? Uh, shastra means I am referring to old Shastras like Vyakarana, Mimamsa, Tarka, etc., Vedanta. So, but day and then, like a God-given thing, like one of the vibhutis of Lord Krishna or Vishnu. So, our internet has come, our, uh, say there are so many people, there is so much of information available everywhere. I believe, I think, I, my own contention is that internet is a sort of divine gift. So, now somebody sitting in America, he, he, he appears for a Sanskrit examination in the Hindu University of America, he listens to my talks and all that, I find some, some such people. So I am very happy that uh, the Shastra tradition will not die and uh, Hinduism, um, maybe Hinduism, we do not know whether, uh, like Francois Gauthier just now said, uh, he doesn't, I am very happy that he told a very, very realistic, uh, I mean, in a realistic way, he did not unnecessarily give, any, give us any false hope. <laughs> so I congratulate, in fact, I thanked him also for his very realistic uh, assessment. So now today, the, the topic, and, and also to, before starting, I also want to thank Professor uh, Sudarshan Raoji and also Radha Kumariji and others for having given me this opportunity to be here to speak in front of you. The topic given to me today is the Vedas, Sanatana Dharma as the source for reconstructing the cultural heritage of Bharat. In fact, the title was much longer, I actually made it short. After making it short, it is like that. The Vedas, Sanatana Dharma is the source for reconstructing the cultural heritage of Bharat. So in fact, when we, if we see the overall, the world situation now, we are actually meeting at a time where there is a lot of uh, churning, or rather a lot of upheaval in the field of culture in several countries. If you are following what is happening in uh, Europe and America and those places, they are actually, they are, they are also in great danger of losing their culture. In fact, various new and mad ideas like wokeism and then things like gender fluidity and various other things, they have come into their social life and the old family norms are broken. Until recently, we used to know, even a child could say who is a man and who is a woman. Now the Supreme Court of America is debating as to how to define a woman. So that is the stage in which they are. So we are in such a stage of confusion. We are not we, not we. Uh, the Western countries who boast of very great uh, civilization and all that, they are battered by so many mad ideas from various uh, quarters. So we are also facing a similar situation from, for different reasons. So we have to see what are the philosophical foundations, what exactly are the threats, and what can we do for reconstructing. So we, since yesterday we had uh, Many speakers, we heard so many speakers talking about how history has to be rewritten and all that. It's a very, very great thing because that alone can build up that sense of pride in the young minds. So that is a very important thing. And this subject was also partly, I mean, spoken by my friend Mr. R. V. S. S. Avadhanlu. He also spoke about the Puranas and then the Vedic literature and all that. It is a sort of continuation of what Professor, I mean, R. V. S. S. Avadhani said. So this cultural heritage, if we see, it is usually associated with a religion. If we, whenever we talk about a culture, whether it is Western culture or Indian culture, it is usually associated with the religion of that particular land. And um, in the case of, if we see the Abrahamic religions, for example, Christianity, Islam and Judaism, these three are the Abrahamic religions, they do have one book. That one book alone gives them the theology, epistemology, ontology, whatever, and also morals. For them, what uh, that particular one book says, it, it contains everything. And luckily for us, 
and when for them it will be very difficult to change it also and for us luckily we have got two levels of um, text i don't know till i started reading uh, sanskrit i started till i started knowing about gita i never knew that there is a thing called shruti and smriti i was considering myself a fairly well educated man but then i never knew i never heard about those two words called shruti and smriti so luckily when i got into by my great good luck when i got into the studies of sanskrit then i for the first time i heard that oh there is what is called shruti shruti is the basically the primary text of hinduism primary text of sanatan dharma we can say what is this so primary about it shruti as the very word indicates shruti means something which has been heard and what is it that has been heard it is heard by and by whom it is heard by the rishis and it is heard as a sort of divine voice so it is not as though they sat and then they heard some divine voice they sat in deep contemplation they were trying to know what is the nature of reality who am i the basic question and what is me what is this the world around me the jagat around me and this jiva jagat and also what we call the and the supreme reality what exactly is the connection so this sort of examination they started doing and then there was no agenda to start a religion the basic thing we have to see is that they had no agenda to start a religion they were basically it is not one person religion usually if you talk about abrahamic religions you find somebody who has who started that religion at a particular point of time in history and then he claimed yes i have got some divine communication and then it is my duty to make you all accept <laughs> and because of some good luck he could follow some, he could get some immediate followers and because of some good luck he could also build up some army and then he could invade and then capture and then he could spread the religion like that so but then in the case of hinduism it is not by one person it is by so many sages yesterday our friend avadhan lu was giving a long list of sages that long list of if we see these are all the people who who were contemplating the nature of reality in so many places not in one place in so many places and they used to occasionally meet they used to occasionally meet like if you read a book called bruhadaranyaka upanishad there is a king janaka we don't know whether he is the same janaka who was the father of uh, uh, sita but then there is a king janaka in whose court so many people all this um, scholars all this rishis they used to sit and then they used to debate as to whether god is one or whether there are so many crores 33 crore gods etc so all these thing they used to discuss and then they, they they were debating as to the nature of reality so that was the point and debate and discussion is the hallmark of our hindu civilization indian civilization not only in hinduism you find it in buddhism jainism of course sikhism is a religion which has come in very very tough times we don't expect uh, that uh, debate in that but buddhism jainism and hinduism the sanatana dharma or hinduism there is a lot of debate there is a lot of debate and discussion they are both, they are all encouraged and without debating the student and in fact the student also is supposed to pose questions to the teacher and the teacher should not get angry ma vidvisha vahai so in that mantra the very opening mantra says ma vidvisha vahai let us let us not have any ill feelings if you question and then if i can't answer i should not have any ill feelings so that sort of environment was there and in that quest what is the type of quest suppose uh, i mean there is one small episode in one upanishad called um, taitriya upanishad one son his name is bhrugu he goes to his father varuna so the mantra says bhrugur vai varuni hi varunam pitaram upasasara in fact avadan lu told that read that line yesterday also so he goes to his father and asks him oh dad your father he doesn't say oh dad or father oh bhagavan adihi bhagavo brahmeti oh my lord you please tell me what is the nature of reality then what does the father say father says it is something which cannot be straight away communicated to you it is something which you have to contemplate and then you have to realize so how do you contemplate and what is the equipment you have for contemplation so he says you are having this the food body annamaya kosha pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha etc etc you have got these five indriyas sense organs and the mind and tapasa brahma vijignyasasva tapasa tapasi is thinking contemplation tapas is not something going to forest or anything you have to sit quietly in a, in a very undisturbed manner in our own room nowadays you don't have any forest to go and then we have to sit and think 
So tapasa brahma vijignyasa swa, tapo brahma iti. And what is the equipment you have? What is the laboratory you have? Your own mind is the laboratory. Instead of looking outward, you have to look inward. Annam pranam chachur mano pranam iti. That's what he says. You are having this annamaya body, pranamaya kosha, etc., etc. You have to think. You withdraw from the external world and you think. Then what is the solution ultimately that uh, Upanishad gives? What is the nature of the highest reality? It is not Brahma or Vishnu or anybody. If you go to religion, somebody says Vishnu is supreme, somebody says Shiva is supreme, somebody says somebody else is supreme. But then Upanishads, our Vedic literature says there is only one reality and that is not a person. It is called Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. It says Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. If you want to translate into English, it means infinitely existing consciousness. The exact translation will be infinitely existing consciousness. And that consciousness has got a power to manifest as this whole universe. And what all we see, all of us, all of us, both animate and inanimate, everything, is a manifestation in that consciousness. So this is, this is the most modern question also. Even now, we are debating on this issue, whether matter is primary or intelligence is primary. Matter and consciousness, the debate is even now going on. And materialists, of course, they say that consciousness comes from matter. But then somehow the Upanishadic sages said uh, you know, consciousness is something which is manifesting as um, consciousness is something which is manifesting as this whole universe, both animate and inanimate. So this is what they said. And you have to give a name for that. And what is the name given to that for, for usage? You have to give a name. And what is the name given to that? They called it Brahman. Just Brahman. Brahman is a neuter gender. If you say Vishnu, you say he. You use the pronoun he. If you say Lalita, you say she, but there is no he or she. Uh, of course, there, is no, there was no gender fluidity at that time, no LGBT, etc. They said it. So when you say it, so that is how we find in that sentence also, Tat Tvam Asi. Tat is a pronoun of neuter gender. Tat is, not, is a pronoun of neuter gender. So it is referred to in that way. So that is the highest reality. And uh, you see, uh, the Upanishads, uh, they also realize the limitations of the human beings because if you say that this is the only reality and you have to work well and then you have to be moral, you have to be ethical in your behavior, who will listen, who will not listen. So you need somebody with a rod sitting above and then monitoring us, trying to see what you are doing, recording what we do and what, all, what we think, everything. So we, they also allowed all this thing at a lower level. At a lower, lower level, I use the word lower level. We also talk about gods at two levels. That is, if the absolute reality is something which is absolutely unchanging, and that is something which is which is that what we call Brahman. And for all the for all practical purposes, you need somebody. If that is how we said. Okay, the society there were already in the society there were already so many traditions. Somebody somewhere somewhere in the land, some area they were followers of Vishnu. In South India, they were followers of uh, Muruga, Ganesh, etc. In some other areas like uh, Orissa, they were followers of, uh, say, uh, uh, Sun God. So like that, Shiva, Vishnu, everything. All these things, uh, they integrated. They wanted to harmonize. So that is what happened. So what? So reality, when you come to God, God again is at two levels. One is called the higher level or the absolute level. And the other is a tentative level. Or, I mean, this... Uh, uh, what we call transactional or empirical level. So that is, what, that is how our people say, defined. And if I say somebody to a, star, a strong Vaishnava or a strong Shaiva, uh, they will uh, fight with me. But then this is what Vedanta says. This is absolutely, this is what Vedanta says. And this is not to uh, discourage anybody or anything, but this is what is reality. So that is one level, one thing. So that is where, in order to come to these, uh, say, conclusions, there are things like uh, the epistemology and ontology which you don't find in other places like in the morning Francois Gauthier was saying there's something unique our people thought in a totally different way epistemology what is what are the means of valid knowledge or rather what is what are the valid means of knowledge and pratyaksha pramana pratyaksha etc pratyaksha anumana pramana i'm sorry upamana shabda so many things uh, yeah, all these uh, pramanas they said, but all these pramanas cannot lead to that. So that is why it is called apramaya, something which cannot be known by the pramanas. 
something which you have to think and then find out that which knows everything that which knows everything how can you know, how can you know it with your senses and mind and when your mind operates that is what is behind everything so that is what is a knower so how can we know the knower so that is what is the question is the basic question so that is where issues like ontology the world which we are seeing in front of us whether it is real or tentatively real all such questions you don't find anywhere in any other text except in the vedanta text so this is one uh, uh, say one important uh, aspect then as i said these are the vedas are the primary texts vedas means vedas include upanishads also veda it is called vedanta why is it called vedanta the end portion veda plus anta the end portions of the veda are vedanta that is the philosophy they are the philosophical texts and right from the beginning we have got several several philosophical passages in the vedas so vedas when we say the primary text and in the primary text there is not much about the ethics there is not here and there there are some comments but then there is not much about ethical uh, ethics and uh, all this uh, day to day behavior uh, how a person has to conduct himself in society etc so but then uh, we, there are secondary texts what are called smruti shruti is one directly heard or something which is uh, visualized in their uh, uh, state of uh, contemplation the second is smruti something which is uh, recalled to memory smruti smaranam you know the word smruti smaranam so that is uh, recalled to memory something which is recalled from what is to, uh, yeah, from what is told in the vedas so that is what is the smruti and the smrutis again are two types that is one is itihasa the other is no itihasa and purana can be put in one category and the other are the dharma shastra granthas you have got so many texts so primary texts are only four that is the four vedas but the secondary texts probably they run into roughly 100 uh, around 100 maybe if you include uh, itihasa two puranas about uh, 18 plus upapuranas plus about 40 odd smruti granthas starting from anusmruti to so many other smrutis if you include all those things they come to roughly 100 so so many texts are there and in these texts there are so many details about how a person has to conduct himself so shruti may say something broadly you tell the truth satyam vada dharman chara so something like that in a very very brief manner it is somewhat like a text of law but then this is something like a case law you we know the case law and case law so the advocates they talk about case law <laughs> so they have to see the case law if you say somebody is telling the truth so uh, what uh, what exactly are the ingredients of that particular thing called truth so are all those ingredients um, present here or not so we have to see that so this uh, truth is something or dhanam what is dhanam dhanam again the upanishad simply says dhanam or maybe sometimes it may elaborate slightly a little bit Uh, what uh, like uh, one upanishad says hriya uh, deyam shriya deyam samvida deyam etc one upanishad says you you give you uh, whatever you give with you give with some amount of humility and you give according to your whatever money you have whatever uh, i mean wealth uh, depending on your state of wealth so things like that but then uh, this case law what we find in this smriti they tell us as to how the human being has to behave then the one important thing in the veda vedic literature is that uh, the vision of oneness when i said there is only one reality that is supreme reality called brahman which is manifesting as the whole thing that is basically the vision of oneness and that vision of oneness right from the beginning right from the vedas we are saying that is we, if we see the mantra everybody knows the line ekam sat vipra bahudha vadanti we all most of us know the line the full shloka and the, the mantra goes like this indram mitram varunam agnimahu atho divya divyasya suparno garutman ekam sat vipra bahudha vadanti agnim yamam matarishvanam ahu whatever you call it agni matarishva varuna whatever you say they are all manifestations of that one reality and if we see purusha suktam yesterday also there was a reference to purusha suktam uh, in fact uh, mr i think david trolley he was uh, mentioning this purusha suktam purusha evedagam sarvam he said that one riya one purusha is the whole thing purusha again is a technical word purusha doesn't mean man purusha doesn't mean it, it excludes a stree or anything purusha includes every ant every mosquito everything anything and also a blade of grass Uh, brahma adi stamba paryantam it says brahma means there is what is called a creator brahma creator brahma is also a created person is a manifestation in the reality 
So in that manifestation, we visualize for our own purposes, we visualize it as a, as a cosmic uh, uh, entity called Brahma. So that cosmic entity called Brahma, so he, from, from starting from that, we can call him the cosmic being. Purusha, Purusha means that which pervades, that which enters into all the Pura, Puri Sete, Puram, Puram, our body is like a Puram, Puram is a town or a village, whatever. So our body is like that, and then that which goes into all Puras, in the form of intelligence, in the form of intelligence and activates the intelligence of all the beings. So that is what is Purusha. So Purusha doesn't mean it excludes history or anything. So this Purusha, Purusha Sukta is an experiment, not experiment, a sort of visualization. Like yesterday, Conrad else was saying, it was a sort of visualization of the whole universe or whole creation as one organic being. To say that everybody is part of that. So Purusha Evedakam Sarvam Yad Bhutan Yacha Pavyam, that is whatever is present here, whatever is present, past, future, everything is that Purusha only. And Sahasra Shirusha Purusha, when I was young, I was only thinking, why only 1000 heads? <laughs> in, the, in Vedic literature, when we say 1000, it means infinite. Infinite. That's all. Infinite. That means even the head of an ant, even the intelligence which is present in the antakarana of an ant is a reflection of that cosmos, that supreme, uh, say, consciousness. So that is the idea which uh, we have or which we said in the Upanishads. And of course, when it has percolated to our Vedic, uh, I mean, daily rituals also. In fact, Purusha Sukta, it is so um, ubiquitous. You find it everywhere. You go to a temple and then you, offer, you try to ask them to do some puja. They do Purusha Sukta Vidhanam. So Purusha Sukta Vidhana, they recite the same thing. And um, similarly, immediately after Purusha Sukta, there is another thing which we say, Sab Brahma, Sa Shiva, Sa Hari, Sa Indra, Sot, Sharaf, Paramaswarat. You say, He is Brahma, He is Vishnu, He is Shiva. That is what is Akshara, Brahma, etc., etc. So like this, we have these mantras, any number of uh, mantras in uh, this Vedic literature, mantra pushpam, we say, Tvam Brahma, Tvam Rudra, Tvam Prajapati, etc., etc. So all these things. Then again, if you see, uh, coming to Indian knowledge systems, I, I will not uh, touch, uh, touch upon them too much, because yesterday Mr. Avadhanlu was talking about them. Uh, Indian knowledge, I will just make a mention. Indian knowledge systems, again, they are the pillars. They are the pillars of our culture. They are, uh, there are six Vedanga, Vedanga with the limbs for uh, understanding the Vedas. That is Shiksha, Vyakaranam, Chandas, Nerukta, Jyotisha and Kalpa. These six are the branches of, uh, not branches of Vedas, they are the auxiliary or rather the um, limbs of the Vedas. These are essential in order to understand what is told in the meaning, uh, what is told in the Vedas. Yesterday we were listening to Mr. Nilesh who talked about uh, the astronomy, the importance of astronomy in understanding our text. In fact, it is very much necessary, probably somebody might have done analysis regarding the Vedas also, they might have done. There are great um, people in West also, uh, our own people who are in the West, who are like you know, Professor Subhash Kak, somewhere in, uh, uh, I think he is in Atlanta or somewhere. somewhere. And uh, Professor Ramasubramanyam, if you know, he is in Mumbai, IIT Mumbai. There are some such people who have done a lot of research into that. So we need the knowledge of Shiksha. Shiksha is phonetics. You see, we have given our interaction with Indian culture has given this what is called 18th century enlightenment. You see, this is, we often very, very, very often forget. Like um, Francois was saying in the morning, people made us believe that we knew we know nothing. We are all snake catchers and snake charmers, etc. <laughs> so, but then we have forgotten. The more basic problem is we have forgotten. So, this India acquaintance with the Indian systems. Uh, started starting with um, even old philosophers like Schopenhauer and people like that. And then Emerson, Emerson and um, Thoreau, they were actually called the Boston Brahmins. You might have heard about the word called Boston Brahmins. You just Google, in that Google search, you go type just Boston Brahmins and then you get right down to T.S. Eliot and all those, T.S. Eliot and then W.B. Yeats, those people, they were all in the list of Boston Brahmins. So these people, they, uh, actually Emerson and uh, Thoreau, they knew about our uh, basic text that is the Veda, Upanishads, etc. Even before Vivekananda went to America, Vivekananda before he spoke at that uh, Chicago, uh, so these people were, were aware of those texts. So this knowledge had spread even by that time. So Shiksha is something which is talk about phonetics. I was talking about this uh, intellectual uh, uh, movements. One intellectual movement which the West saw was the Renaissance. 
And the second intellectual moment, they say, is the 18th century enlightenment. 18th century enlightenment is the direct result of their interaction with the Chinese and Indian civilizations. So that we have to kindly note, and then there is a lot of research needed into this field, both Chinese and India. Not only India, we should not boast. Chinese also had great civilization. So Chinese and Indian civilization. And in fact, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Toyin, not Toyin B, uh, no, uh, the history of, uh, uh, study of history by Will Durant. Will Durant's first volume is uh, Our Oriental Heritage. Will Durant, there is a historian called Will Durant, a philosopher also. Uh, that Oriental Heritage, we have, to, we have to necessarily read that book to know about ancient India. So in that book, he writes both about Chinese and Indian civilization. And these two civilizations have given a lot many, lot, given lot many insights to, I don't say that they have copied, uh, they, have, they copied all, our, uh, all the rockets and all the technology from us. Uh, but then, lot many insights, there, there is a totally new idea. In fact, the liberty, fraternity, equality, all these ideas, they are fine, they are in the Upanishads. Walter and Rousseau, they were actually impressed. They were um, uh, great students of these Upanishads. They were all knowing, knowing all these Upanishads. So anyway, Shiksha is something relating to phonetics, how the word has to be correctly pronounced. Uh, Vyakaranam again is grammar. Chandas is prosody. Neruktam. Neruktam is again an etymological, unless you know the etymological meaning, you do not know uh, as to what meaning you have to take at a particular place. Then uh, Jyotisha, then, like we said, astro astronomy. Then again, Kalpa, Kalpa, um, Sulba Sutras, etc., talking about the mathematical, uh, uh, say, the, how, how a Vedi, Yajna Vedi has to be built and all that. All that. There are certain uh, our modern uh, scholars like Ramasubramanyam, they say, about how basic principles of geometry and economy, sorry, trigonometry, etc., they were known to them. Then again, there are, we have got this Upavedas, etc. Upa, again, then again, we have got texts of this Ayurveda. I will not go into details, Ayurveda, etc. Then Neeti Shastra is another thing where some more research is needed. Neeti means not morals. Neeti doesn't mean morals. Neeti means uh, the statecraft. Uh, Kamandaka Neeti Shastra, there is a book called Kamandaka Neeti Shastra. Of course, Artha Shastra of Kautilya is, now, Kautilya is known to many people. But Kamandaka Neeti Shastra is not known to many people, not commented upon, not, uh, not uh, research by scholars. That is one book which I found where I was reading Ramayana. For Ramayana, there is one Vyakya called Dharma Kutam. Dharma Kutam. In that, that particular writer has quoted extensively from that Kamandaka. I was so surprised. In fact, when I was teaching, uh, my talks on Ramayana are there on the YouTube. Uh, so I taught Ramayana right from beginning to end. <laughs> After reading about Sheldon Pollock, I did not make any reference to Sheldon Pollock, but I gave uh, about 200 and odd talks are there on the YouTube. So, but anyway, that Kamandaka Neeti Shastra is something which requires a lot of study. I found lot many good things in that. Similarly, from Raja Dharma Parva, of, uh, a part of Shanti Parva, of Mahabharata, a lot of research is needed in that. Then again, we have got Yoga Upanishads. There are, out of 108 Upanishads, we have got about 20 Upanishads which talk about Yoga. In addition, we have got this tradition called Yoga tradition, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, etc. Patanjali Yoga Sutras, again, is a sort of treatise on this, uh, then this whole system of Veda. And that again has given a lot of insights to all the modern psychologists. If you take a book of modern psychology, when will it start? It will not start with from any ancient thing. It will only start from 18th century or something like that. So very many concepts of um, Western psychology now, your, for example, your stream of consciousness. Patanjali says, Parnat Patanjali, Patanjali's commentary that um, where there is a bhashyam called Vyasa bhashyam. So there, there is Chitta Srotaha. Chitta Srotaha Vahati Punyaya Vahati Papaya. Chitta Srotaha. Srotaha srota means uh, flow. This flow of the mind, this stream of consciousness, all these ideas. So many ideas, if you see, if you just listen to your, uh, this uh, Patanjali, in fact, I was fortunate to teach that also, I have taught the entire Patanjali Yoga Sutra, so if somebody is interested, kindly listen to that Patanjali Yoga Sutra, right from all the four Padas, along with uh, that uh, Sanskrit commentary also I have taught. Then again, there are so many things uh, in that ancient, uh, uh, say, our knowledge traditions, I will not go into that. This Shastra Charcha I, I, I mentioned, that is the debating tradition which is there in us. And another point we have to note is that there was no conflict between science and, uh, uh, say, religion. Because our religion also, suppose you are a Vaishnava, 
So you are worshipping Vishnu, but at the same time, you are using, you are reading out the same mantras or same passages from the Vedas, which refer to that Supreme Consciousness. When we, when we are reading, when you go to the Shiva temple, Shiva temple also you read Purusha Sukta, etc. You go to Vishnu temple, there also you read Purusha Sukta. The same mantras. And even at home, even at home, when we are doing puja, our daily puja, we read Purusha Sukta, we read Rudram. Rudram, what is Rudram? Rudram again, it, it mentions all the people in the society, all tribes of Namo, uh, uh, what is that, Rathakarebhya, Rathibhya, Rathakarebhya. In fact, it also says about Namo uh, Mahadhya, uh, Shulakebhya, Shavonamo, to great people and also to me, mean people, and also to Shvabhya, Shvapatibhya, that is to dogs and also to people who, who, who maintain the kennels. <laughs> Rathakarebhya, Rathibhyo, Rathakarebhya, etc. All sections of that society, that primitive society, not primitive, we cannot say, whatever, primitive, okay, we can also say that. Some five, six thousand years ago, or in fact, yesterday he was saying, our Nilesh ji was saying, we should not say five, six thousand years, it is something which is absurd. But anyway, whatever it is, so they, whatever uh, social uh, say, sections were there at that time, all those things are mentioned. Why? Saying that all these are forms of the same Rudra. They are, it is not as though all these are different sections, they have to be divided, etc. Et these are all, they, they are the forms of the same Rudra. One Rudra is manifesting in so many ways. That is, you are trying to visualize the whole society as one unit, and then it is, a, it is something which is, if you see even um, somebody who is eating a dog, you have to see him as one manifestation of Rudra. So you have to give him adequate, uh, the proper respect. So that sort of vision is there. And our idea is to see that oneness in all things. If you see Gita also, Gita again and again it says, for example, it says, uh, uh, one prominent thing is in the 18th chapter, that is where the vision of oneness, the Jnanam, Sattvika Jnanam, Rajasa Jnanam and Tamasa Jnanam. Sattvika Jnanam is something which sees oneness in thousands of things. He says, Sarva Bhuteshu, Yen Aikam Jnana, Yekam Bhavam Avyayam Ikshate, Avibhaktam Vibhakteshu, Tak Jnanam Vidhi Sattvikam. That is, Avibhaktam Vibhakteshu. That is, they look as so totally divided, totally different. But then it is one, one Avibhaktam, one undivided thing which is seen as so many divided things. What a wonderful statement. But then Rajasa, Rajasa Jnanam is something which divides. Rajasa Jnanam is something, this is different, that is different, that is different. So that is what we say divide and rule. But our approach is unity in diversity. So that is the basic distinction, one value which we have to see. And such a vision basically has shaped our religious traditions also. You see, why these Vaishnavas and Shaivas did not fight right from the beginning? Of course, they fought sometime in, say, after 12th century or so when the Upanishadic thought was forgotten in society. When the Upanishadic thought declined and then its influence declined, then these Shaivas, Vaishnavas, etc., they took support of the kings. Uh, the best way to fight is we have to take support of a king. So they took support of the kings and then they, um, uh, they fought. We see issues in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, not Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, etc. So, but then in the beginning they did not fight. So even if a person was a Vaishnava, he also had respect for Shiva. And why, why, how did it happen? We, we all know the famous story of Shankaracharya, person who was born in Kaladi, uh, Kerala, who went right up to Srinagar. <coughs> he discussed with so many scholars all over the country. And then he saw what were the prominent uh, religious traditions in various parts of the country. And then uh, he said, <coughs> he also uh, said, these are certain um, say non, not exactly non-Vedic, they are certain primitive or rather crude uh, in human traditions. For example, Bali, Bali means that's a human sacrifice, etc. So those things, certain many things he negated and then he systematized, he harmonized so many traditions. So that is why he was called Shanmatasthapanacharya. You don't find any, um, any one person establishing six religions. Whereas Shankaracharya is called Shanmatasthapanacharya, a person who established are standardized or harmonized six uh, traditions. He also introduced the system called Panchayatanam. Panchayatana is if you go to some uh, traditional person's house, you find what is called a Panchayatanam. Uh, for example, my, uh, my, my home family deity is uh, Narasimha Swami. 
a form of Vishnu, let us say. So I put that in the middle, Narsimha Salagramam in the middle, and then all around, we have got uh, Ganesha on one side, uh, Sun on one side, and Durga on one side, and uh, Surya on one side. So this is called Panchayatanam. Adityam, Ambikam, Vishnum, Gananatham, Maheshwaram. These are five other Panchayatana. So this sort of harmony was brought in by very many, all these religious leaders. So this is uh, one thing which we see. So these are the things uh, which, uh, which unite the country and uh, you know, so they saw the unity among people. And uh, <clears throat> of course yesterday, uh, Sanatana Dharma, yeah, now we come to the question of Sanatana, the word Sanatana. Sanatana literally means not ancient. Sanatana means something which is eternal. If you see Amarakosha, Sanatana, Sadatana, that is the word Amarakosha says. Sanatana means Sana is a, um, is a word, which, uh, word which says always, it is something which is always there. Then that is that. How way? Why is it there? Yesterday also, Mr. Uh, uh, Conrad Els was commenting about uh, apovrushaya. Apovrushaya is something. It is not as though something it has come directly from God. Something which is impersonal in nature. In fact, I totally agree with that. Even modern scholars, very many modern scholars, they agree with that view. Uh, that it is something which is impersonal. It is something like physics. He was giving the example of physics. So when you say that absolute reality is nothing but it is a infinitely existing consciousness, then how, where is the question of debating with that? It is applicable here in India, it is applicable in Australia, it is applicable somewhere, applicable somewhere in Africa, everywhere it is applicable. So that is, that is one thing which we have to see. And that is why it is called Sanatana Dharma. And Dharma again, there are several definitions. For example, the Manusmriti, which many people don't want to uh, see also, <laughs> many people burn also. That Manusmriti, if we really read, there are a couple of passages, there are a few, very, very few lines which are really horrible. We do not know whether they are insertions, I don't say they are insertions or anything because I don't know, I can't, I am not an expert in that field. Um, but, say, but then, there are so many great things also in that. We have to read Manusmriti, uh, there is a Kullu Kapatta Vyakhyanam, luckily it is also in Telugu, kindly you can see a book stall where that Vyakhyanam also is translated into Telugu, uh, kindly read that book, we all have to read that book. So there, there is a great definition, like a very comprehensive definition about dharma. Dharma, we all know that dharanat, dharma, which it is a very simplest definition, dharanat, that which holds the society from uh, falling apart, from breaking. So if you want to hold something together, you have to have something which is keeping all the people, uh, say, agreeable to that. Suppose you have got a value system to which all the people are agreeable, then only they will be together. If you have some system, okay, I maintain my own distance, my own height, and then you have, you be there at my feet. <laughs> so, some people will slip away. So, that cannot be dharma. So, dharma is something which holds. And the, the definition given is a wonderful definition. If I have time, I'll, time I suppose, sir. It's 11, 30, 53, okay. The dharma, it says, Vedvadvis sevita sadhihi. I, I will not read that shloka. The meaning is, that is something which is, uh, followed by learned people, not merely learned people, but those who are committed to truth. And also Nityam Advesha Raghi Vihi, those who have transcended this Dvesha and Raga. And again, Hrudayena Abhyanugnata, that which comes from their heart. It is not as though they are doing some lip service to that, it has to come from the heart. So those people, they are the, they are the that is what is Dharma. Their conduct or what they say or what they do is Dharma. So that is a wonderful uh, definition. And if we see, come to Itihasas also, Itihasas, the same um, uh, thing is there, some uh, same plan. In fact, our, the plan of our ancients to transmit this heritage to the common man was through Itihasa and Purana. In Mahabharata, the very first chapter says, Itihasa Purana Abhyam, Purana Abhyam Vedam Samupa Burmayet, he says. There is a formula given. You have to transmit uh, the, that what we call nowadays this intergenerational transfer and what not. <laughs> so all that thing has to happen through this Itihasa and Purana. What is told as uh, some, uh, some uh, statement of law, it has to be explained through this Itihasa and Purana. So that is how this Itihasa and Puranas came into existence. That was the uh, scheme. That was the scheme of uh, teaching. So this is one uh, thing which we have to note. And in that uh, sense only, with keeping that in mind only, this Vyasa and Valmiki, they uh, created the certain great, uh, two great Itihasas. In fact, both of them, they have got such a great 
a grand uh, cultural vision for the whole society and that vision guided the society till day, gu is guiding the society till date. Yesterday there was a reference to Ramayana. If we see the uh, episode of marriage of uh, Sita and Rama, the same procedure is continuing even now. <laughs> the same procedure uh, is continuing now. And again, if we see Shiva Kalyana, Parvati Kalyana, Parvati Sh Shiva Kalyana also, there again, the same tradition is continued. It's such a living tradition which is there right from those Itihasa days and also Purana days, something which we see. Then again, this, uh, the two levels, coming back to the two levels called Shruti and Smriti, we can always change this Smriti. That thing also is permitted in our own text, our own Smriti. Shruti says, where there is a contradiction between Shruti and Smriti, Smriti can be ignored or you have to keep it aside. That is, that is a formula, established formula, even in the Vedas. And in fact, the Taittiri Upanishad also, there is a line saying, Atha yadite dharma vichikitsava, vritta vichikitsava, syat, ye tatra brahmana, sammarsina, some people who may be knowing that line. So if you have got any doubt about what has to be done and what is right and what is wrong in a particular place, you see what the elders of that place, what the learned people, again learned and also people who are conscientious, such, such, what such people are doing. You please follow that. So that is what it says. So, Smriti is something which can be changed. And in this context, I have to tell you that our Guruji, he got a new Smriti written. In fact, I always say, our Swamiji's big squad, Swamiji's iconic people, they have to come together and then write a modern Smriti. When everybody is throwing, uh, thrown stone, uh, throwing stones on us, hey, why, we are not even trying to defend ourselves, we are not even trying to say, this is the truth. <laughs> so, when somebody says, Sanatana Dharma is caste, we are not saying that Sanatana Dharma is not caste. So that Purusha Sukta, unfortunately, one particular line in that Purusha Sukta, out of one, uh, out of 10,000 mantras in Purusha Sukta, there is only one mantra which talks about, in that same Purusha Sukta, which I said is a visualization of the whole, um, I mean, society as one organic being. There is one uh, line which says, Brahmano Syamakamasi, Bahu Rajanya Prataha, this famous or notorious line, many people know. Uh, and uh, that is the reason why people, they burn, <laughs> Marasmati. But then, that is only a visual, not only a visualization, it doesn't say Brahmanaha, you see the actual meaning also, Brahmanaha Asya Mukham Asit. There may be many people who know Sanskrit, Brahmanaha Asya Mukham Asit means Brahman became its head, Asit, not even became, he was, he was his head. Bahu Rajanya Krataha, Rajanya Kshatriya was made his shoulders and Vaishya was made into his thighs. And Padmyam Shudra Jayata, unfortunately that one particular line says, from the feet Shudra came. So in the first three Padas, the Sinta, the, uh, the, the, the whatever you say, that Vibhakti is different. And the last Pada, that Vibhakti is different. Padmyam, it says, Panchami Vibhakti, it comes. From the feet Shudra came. And unfortunately that one particular line is, a great boon for our Western rulers. They, they said, okay, you, this is what they called Varna. This again, Varna and caste, I have written a lot about uh, it in my book. I will not go into that because it's a very big subject. Our people have only talked about Varna, but not caste. The only thing we have to remember is, Varnas are only four, depending on the mixture of, mixture of the Sattva, Rajas and Tamoguna in different proportions. In different proportions and different beings, not only human beings, but in all animals. The one animal, one the same cow, if you see one cow is uh, having some rajoguna, it goes to, uh, angrily looks at everybody. Then even a dog, it can be a dog, it can be any animal, even the vegetables we eat, even the food we eat, food we eat is again sattva guna, rajoguna, etc. So everything in the universe, nata dasti prithivyam yat, Gita says, these three, three gunas, they are the, they go to make everything in the universe organic, I mean organic, inorganic, what are rather sentient and insentient. So these the varnas, there are only four, but castes are 4,000. Kindly note that no Rishi has said, no, um, I mean, uh, God had said, no book has says, but then there is a mention of these things, even in Manasmuthi, mention is there, because they, they were very particular about not allowing varna sankara. Particularly about the Brahmin women, particularly the Brahmin women, they, if, if, if by chance, if they had a child from a Shudra, that Shudra, that person, that boy was called a Chandala. 
we have to know these facts. Basically, if we read Madhusmuti, we see it is not as though new caste is created. There is already a section in the society who are hunters, who are chanda, there are people like that who do all such uh, menial jobs like the skin, uh, skinning of animals and things like that. So very many, uh, all those things, uh, Suta, for example, Suta is a charioteer. The charioteer, that profession was very much there. It is not as though it was newly created by Manu or anything. It was already there in the society. A Swarnakara was already there in the society. Similarly, somebody who was a Vastra, person who is a, what we call uh, weaver, uh, that profession existed in the society. So all these things we have to see. It is not as though Manu created or any other Rishi created. These are already there. There is a mention of these things in the Vedas, but no God, no book. Uh, let us be very, very firm because I, I discussed with several scholars. It is not as though I am a great scholar. I discussed with several great scholars in this uh, Vedic literature, Vedas, Puranas, etc. And everybody says this is what is the reality. It is not a creation by... And nobody comes out. Our great misfortune, as in the morning Francois was saying, uh, our great misfortune is our Swamiji's are silent. Who has to speak? Who has... Our Swamiji's are silent. So, in fact, Hinduism, uh, my guru, Tattvavidananda ji, he says, he says Hinduism is not a vertical religion where there is a, there is a command. Uh, like in uh, Christianity, there is a pope and then that pope appoints bishops everywhere in the world. So th there is no such command here. There is nobody between me and the Brahman. In fact, there is nobody between a human being and the Brahman. You become a Brahman. You, you purify your mind and you become Brahman. That is what it says. So, so that is the reason why, uh, unfortunately, Nobody is coming forward. Nobody is coming forward and uh, in Hinduism, he says, my guru Satovidananda says, it is a horizontal religion where everybody is responsible for uh, preserving dharma. You and I, everybody, particularly the youngsters here, I request them, kindly know Sanskrit. Why? If you don't know Sanskrit, you will be always uh, moving around, uh, I mean, all these secondary texts, secondary sources. The primary source is only the Sanskrit. In fact, even a historian, Yesterday, I realized that historian has to jolly well know some Sanskrit. And there should be a liberal reading of Sanskrit, not only in the Shastras, but very liberal reading, including literature and all that. Literature, they should know art, and then they should know tradition. All these things, they are very much needed. So, my appeal or request to all the youngsters is, there is nothing wrong. You are not going to become, uh, as a Purohits, uh, by learning Sanskrit. So kindly learn Sanskrit. That is, a, that is something which opens up a totally new world. It, is a to, it opens up a new world. By not knowing, you are always at the mercy of some, uh, some Sheldon Pollock or Wendy Doniger when she writes about this, uh, some Hindus, subaltern studies, etc., etc. We are at the mercy of so many people. We are not knowing what is there in our books. So that is a tragedy. So anyway, coming to this. So this is one important point we have to see is that uh, I am now talking about the challenges for um, in the reconstruction and preservation of culture. The challenges are that we do have several pockets of excellence. Because, for example, if I want to see a great uh, Vyakarna Pandita or some great uh, Nyaya Shastra Pandita, I go to any Peetam, Shrungeri or Kanchi or Peshawar Peetam or any Peetam, and you find great scholars there. And uh, But then, how is it going to unite the society? How is it going to give a feeling to everybody? Yes, it is mine. Even history also, when we say, yes, Mahabharata war took place in 7000 BC or 12,000 BC Ramayana, etc., etc. Of course, that is that it can at least go into people. If somebody, if some, uh, uh, by good fortune, if some history books are changed, of course, many people will know. But then the Shastras, how is it that is going to transform? Because our vision, whatever that win, a vision of oneness is not being put in practice. That is the basic problem. That vision of oneness, where it is not being put in practice. And that is one reason why we are, we are having so much of social distancing. The greatest, um, our strength, of course, I will talk first. One more great strength is the in intrinsic strength of our doctrine. Professor uh, Sudarshan was saying, the philosophical foundation. We are the only people in the whole world now surviving, the last people who are, the only people who are now left in the world, as he was saying in the morning, we are the only people who are having a philosophical foundation for our religion, whereas the other religions, they are based on faith. And that is the reason why many educated people are going out of religion now. 
particularly from Christianity, many people are going out. That is a tragedy, unfortunately. So anyway, uh, so this is, our Shrutis are very egalitarian in nature, very, very liberal, very inclusive, what you call secularism, what you call liberalism, etc. We all, we find all these things in our uh, say, Shruti. But when we come to Smriti, some little bit, po little bit of poison here and there, <laughs> a Shudra should not eat, should not listen to the Vedas, etc. But unfortunately, or rather fortunately, no such thing has been recorded in history. There is one more point we have to see. Everybody says, hey, your books say Shudra should not listen to Vedas. If Shudra listens to Vedas, uh, then again uh, some uh, molten lead has to be poured into his ears, etc. But then all these foreign, uh, I mean, visitors who came from all over the world, they never, they did not record even an isolated incident of any such thing. This is one thing which we have to remember. So our people talked more and did less. Our people, they are very great experts in giving some shapa, giving some uh, strong statements, but doing very little. Right now, like, like us now, we are also, we talk a lot and then do little. So similarly, they also told something in, in our, uh, say, Smritis, but probably, I don't, I have not come across any such incident anywhere recorded by any foreign uh, uh, tourist, even in ancient times, people like Fakian or Huyan Sang, whatever. So this is one thing. So we see that we are very much on philosophical, we are, our dharma is on great philosophical foundation. But then the greatest threat is not what our texts say, but then what is attributed to us. Just now I was referring to that, that is caste, Hinduism is caste. So this is something which has been attributed to us, and I explained in fairly some detail. So this is something which all of us have to know. The caste in India, if we really want to know what is caste, then we have to see our books, our old books. You go to any scholar, you go to any scholar, Hinduism is caste, okay, you go to Marxist scholars also, you go to, go to any other scholar, let them show one authority where, apart from Chaturvarnyam Maya system, etc., even that Chaturvarnyam Maya system, that is again, I have to read one, I have to read one passage from um, Gita Vashya. I will take a few minutes, sir. <coughs> that is, we know that uh, Mahabharata, we know that Gita is only a small part of Mahabharata, we know that. And for the entire Mahabharata, one uh, writer called Nilakantha has written commentary. Of course, there are some other uh, commentaries also. For some um, uh, Parvas, they are available. For the entire Mahabharata, they are not available. For the whole of Mahabharata, this Nilakantha Vyakya is available, also available in the market. So this, uh, for example, in the 18th chapter 41, 18-41, 40, somebody can note, so the sloka says, Brahmana Kshatriya Visham Shudranancha Parantapa Karmani Pravibhaktani Swabhava Prabhavair Gunaihi. So for this Brahmana Kshatriya Visham Shudra, the duties are allocated, allotted. Uh, like you give your job profile, the aptitude test, conduct an aptitude test and then give a job to a person. Karmani Pravibhaktani means works have been divided. Karmani, Karmani means all the duties have been, social responsibilities have been given. Depending on the innate nature of a person, Swabhava Prabhavaihi Gunaihi. There the commentator writes, there is again, he refers to an episode, an uh, episode in Mahabharata. Nilakantha Vyakya is so interesting. So he refers to an episode where, you know, we, we all know the story of Nahusha catching Bhima. All the people they know, you know the story of Nahusha, King Nahusha who got a shapam, who got a curse and then he becomes a huge python and then he can catch anybody, even Bhima gets trapped by him. So Bhima, he is about to be swallowed. Then Dharmaraja comes in search of him and then he uh, sees this, uh, this great uh, sarpa, this sarpa. Then again there is a discussion and then that sarpa says, no, if you answer my questions correctly, then I will free this man. So then he says, you know, there are some questions are there, but one important question was about who is a Brahmana. So you see, even in the, from this, what do we know? Even at that time, even in the Mahabharata time, there was as much debate about what is a Brahmana and how a Brahman should be. So as we are having now. So there, he says, uh, it is like, if you don't give a proper answer, I will swallow this man. It is like uh, somebody saying, putting a gun, tell me the truth, or the, otherwise I will shoot you. Like police interrogation, you have to tell the truth, or the, otherwise I will shoot you. So at that time, we have to jolly well tell the truth. So what is the truth? He says, 
uh, he, he quotes from several other episodes, that is Nahusha episode. He says this, um, you see, there are uh, qualities which are found in general, some qualities which are found in all people, but then some special qualities which are to be there in a Brahmin. What are those qualities? Uh, for example, Satyam, Dhanam, Shama, Silam, etc. These are, these are the, some qualities. So I will read the same uh, Vakyas. Uh, most of you will understand. Uh, Tasmat, Yasmin, Kasmin, Shid, Varne, Shamadayo, Drushyante. Yasmin, Kasmin, Shid, Varne, Shamadayo, Drushyante means in whatever Varna, the Shama, Dhamma, Dhanam, Daya, Titiksha, etc., all these Gunas are there, he has to be treated as a Brahmana. He has to be taken as Brahmana. Yasmin Kasmin Shidvarni, uh, where is it? Shamadayo Dushyante, Sa Shudropi, Etaihi Lakshanaihi Brahmana Yavagyatavya. Even if he is born in a Shudra family, he has to be taken as a Brahmana. Then again, Yatracha, Brahmana Epi Shudra Dharma Dushyante. Even a Brahmin, if he is having that Tamoguna, laziness, basically laziness. Brahmin is not supposed to be lazy. If he is a lazy, he is a Shudra. <laughs> so that is what uh, I am not saying. That is what. Uh, uh, Bharatam says. So, Yetaihi Lakshanaihi, Sudropi Yetai Lakshanaihi, Brahmana Yeva Gyatavya, Yetracha Brahmana Yepi Sudra Dharma Drushyan Tesa Sudra Hayeva, he should be a Sudra. Then again, Tathacha Aranyake, Aranyake means in that Aranya Kanda, uh, that is uh, Aranya Parvam, not Kanda, uh, it is also called Vana Parva in Sanskrit. In that thing, Sarpa Bhutam Nahusham Prati, Yudhishthira Vakyam, Yudhishthirudu, Yudhishthirudu, Yudhanga Jepedata, Yudhi. Satyam, Dhanam, Shama, Silam, Anrushamsyam, Tapo, Vruna, Drushyante, Yetra, Nagendra, Sab, Brahmana, Itishvataha. We Gunalani, Yavdi, Lontayo, Vade, Brahmandu. Tarvata, Yetra, Ita, Lakshyate, Sarpa, Vruttam, Sab, Brahmana. Yetra, Ita, Na, Lakshyate, Yetra, Ita, Na, Bhavet, Yetra, Ita, Na, Bhavet, Sarpa, Tam, Sudra, Mithin, Dishet. Where these qualities are not there, you treat him as a Shudra. So that is what Dharmaraja tells that Nahusha at gunpoint. So, this is what we have to see. So, we have to see these things. There are so many, there are so many things which make, which help us to take a very, very liberal view of things, to take a very, very liberal views. And then, what is all this for? Why are we reconstructing this uh, culture? The very, what is the very purpose of reconstructing culture? The, the purpose of reconstructing our culture is to unite the society. It is not to know that Mahabharata war has taken place at some time or uh, some other war has taken at some other time. So it is to unite society. It is to answer people like uh, this, um, uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, this Stalin or anybody. <laughs> so this is this is what we are all supposed to know. And uh, as I repeat repeatedly, find fault. In fact, in a recent book of mine, I also found fault with our Swamiji's for not coming forward uh, very clearly. They have nothing to lose. They have not, nothing to lose. In fact, their silence is harming us a lot. And Brahmin is a very uh, hounded out, hounded person. Like Francois was telling in the morning, a Brahmin is a person who is much hounded in the society. And uh, one more great threat now we see is what we see from outside, these external theories which are now coming. You must have heard about the critical race theory, etc., which, which is there in America. That is, you might have heard about what is called cultural Marxism. The cultural Marxism, to tell uh, briefly, you see, Marxists, they found that their, uh, say their philosophy, economic philosophy, that is classification of people in terms of economic categories, uh, it worked in some places, but in many places it did not work. In, the, in For example, in European countries it did not work. And so they were wondering as to why they could not uh, achieve uh, this revolution in places like Germany. And in fact, in, from Germany, many people were driven out. Many communists were driven out and then they all went and took shelter in America. And then they were called the Frankfurt School of Communism. And thereafter, it grows and gradually they captured the universities. Where exactly do you capture the minds of people? In the universities. So you go to universities, capture the minds of young people. So now they started a new division called culture. So when they see this economic, the communist theory is oppressor, oppressed. They have to find two people, two polarities. So one is oppressor and the other is oppressed. Then they are very happy talking about the oppressed and then feeling, uh, having a sort of uh, holier than thou feeling, etc. So, but then when the revolution is not happening, you have to divide the society in some manner. So how to divide? So there is not economic oppression, but there is a thing called cultural oppression. So they, they started a theory called critical theory. This is something which is very, very critical for the division of the society. 
and then they called it critical race theory in recent years and in most very recently in the last few years we are also seeing it as critical caste theory which is now being applied to indian society both in america and also here in america they are again they are using the same critical race theory and critical um, caste theory to uh, say um, uh, to target particularly one group that is the brahmin group because if one Bra fellow called brahmin goes away from hindu society then this whole society will be ours so that is what is the basic formula starting from francis xavier so this new doctrines like uh, this uh, wendy doniger's book about uh, this uh, subaltern studies subaltern studies is basically again this cultural division only yours is a hybro culture what all we spoke since yesterday is all this hybro culture what about this low bro culture low bro culture about the common man what what are you see feeling one with you so how are you going to unify with you know unite him low bro there is no such thing as low bro culture we have to do a lot of research and tell them write write lot many books and then tell them rama in fact when he goes to forest guha comes to him and hugs him do you expect guha to come and hug uh, a king if uh, there was no uh, i mean uh, that equality sense of equality and friendship so it is not as though guha rama goes to guha and hugs him guha comes because he know he sees that rama is in distress so he has to be consoled so he himself comes and hugs so there are so many passages like that we see all over our itihasas puranas etc so this is uh, these are the things which we have to bring out so the ramayana also there are several passages i have spoken on those points um, in my some of my talks so these are these people are called the cultural marxists so they use culture cultural divide or cultural division in society as a way of uh, dividing the society that is what we are seeing in uh, now the um, our um, great candidate for prime minister that is rahul gandhi who says Uh, he says, "No, there should be caste. Are you having? Uh, do you? Are you having courage? Are you bold enough to divide caste?" So he is challenging. That Kola Ganana in Hyderabad also Telangana uh, government they wanted to do Kola Ganana. In fact, I wrote an article. Kola Ganana is a Videshi Vektola, Vijay Videshi Shaktola agenda. And all the old Marxists they started writing. In fact, for my article there are four articles uh, which came as a sort of rejoinder. Arvind Rao knows nothing. Uh, so he doesn't know about marxism uh, so cultural marxism they have not heard because they have not updated their knowledge about cultural marxism critical race theory etc so anyway uh, so there are so they are wo so vociferous the enemies are wo so vociferous cultural enemies are so vociferous and we are very innocent so that is again reinforcing what francois gautier has said in the morning so i feel uh, rather i feel rather unhappy that uh, we have to i mean we are not up to the mark in fighting uh, so with uh, these things of course they all this of course some good social experiments are going on like our prime minister is doing something at a political level that uh, kashi uh, tamil sangam or mahakala corridor you know jain ayodhya temple and so many other initiatives but then they will not be adequate so all of us uh, including the religious leaders unless they all move together uh, the very purpose of recreate the re uh, this uh, reconstructing culture the purpose will not be achieved you may write uh, some books and all that but they will be there in libraries or they will be uh, they will not be prescribed <laughs> they can be proscribed maybe so with these words i say that we have to it is a responsibility of every one of us to preserve dharma we have to understand that my again and again my appeal to all youngsters is you have to be aware of the social happenings thank you okay arvind rao garu has clearly given us the principles guiding our culture and and these principles are based on the shastras which have emerged from the vedas from the shrutis shrutis and smritis so what exactly culture works for us as we say about the ishwara who is as a tattva an abstract one would not know 
but when he comes into this rishti he does everything not only does everything he is everything so this way we try to understand the abstract thing manifesting into the universe and it is molding the minds of the intellectual human being this particular species because we are only speaking of when we speak of culture we are speaking only of the human beings and their intellect so that way culture works on two major grounds we have the mind and we have body and body actions the karma so mind the attitudinal functioning a laboratory there so that has to be covered by the culture and the culture the principles the uh, the attitudes are molded in the mind and these attitudes are transferred into the actions so it works in both ways that way the results of the culture is on one way he becomes brahman as arvindra varu has said so the one aspect on the abstract level he becomes a brahman brahmana or brahman whatever we may call and the other way when he the, the entire thing transfers into his life the conduct of his life the karma of his life the attitudes he shows in the society and how he works with the society and within the society this makes him arya so arya is a is a shabda which we use to the person who is in the society arya is not a, is not a, actually as discussed earlier in the, by in so many forums uh, on the intellectual things that no arya is uh, something tribal this is this is again a, a western idea that has come into our minds that no aryans have come from so it is a race or a tribe and they have invaded india and all that so arya means the one who conducts his life according to the principles which are based on the shrutis and the smritis so arya is it's its own term in the manifestation and the brahman is the term when the jiva evolves itself into the ishvara so these two things are that the culture works on both sides so the second aspect that we have chosen for the today's afternoon function is and the meeting is one the philosophical foundations of the culture and the other how it is shown in the manifestation so here again what he uh, arvindra varu has said about niti shastras and attitudes and uh, life of man in the society how it makes him arya